Good morning. Welcome to our panel discussion, uh, live streamed on Facebook, Language Education, Empowering Minds and Bridging Cultures. Ladies and gentlemen, dear panelists, esteemed guests, fellow language enthusiasts, welcome to our panel discussion, Language Education, Empowering Minds and Bridging Cultures. I'm Lyudmila Lertsimavichina and I'm honored to be your moderator for this insightful conversation today. Uh, before we start, I'm delighted to invite the Director of the Institute of Foreign Languages for the opening statement, Professor Omar Kuchulina, whose commitment to the principles of knowledge, cultural understanding, linguistic diversity is exemplary. Omar, please, Thank the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, dear panelists, dear students, uh, all those who are connected uh, online. Uh, so today we celebrate the uh, European Day of Languages. And as we are all aware of the fact that uh, it promotes linguistic diversity and cultural diversity. So there is no denying the fact that uh, well, learning languages opens cultures. Because while learning languages, so we can delve into the depths of the culture, into all the intricacies of, of the culture, and learn more about uh, each other which is very much important in our contemporary world because our classrooms are becoming international, more and more international. Here in this classroom of intercultural communication, we have one student or two students uh, from Lithuania and other students are, well, uh, from other countries. So that is a proof that we have to learn languages and to learn cultures as well. So today's uh, well, topic is uh, about language education, empowering minds and bridging cultures. So what we want to emphasize is the importance of learning languages for us, each of us individually and for us as, as a society. So our panelists today, so our colleagues from the Institute of Foreign Languages of the Faculty of Philology of Vilnius University, so they are linguists, experts, educationalists who have had rich experience of working in intercultural uh, environments, various intercultural environments. So I hope they will share their experience of working in these environments and they will tell us more why this is important, why it is important to study languages. So without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to uh, our colleague, uh, Associate Professor Nabila Atzimavichine, who is going to moderate, as she has already told that, our panel discussion. So she will introduce our panelists. So I wish everybody success, uh, the audience, I wish you be challenged and be empowered. Thank you. Rama, thank you very much for your kind words. Please join thank us. Yes, it's you. a live event. All on Facebook, join us. So we're at the back so that you're also seen by our audience. And I would also like to share before we proceed that this is the model we're actually practicing with our students, one of the activities of, as a panel discussion. And as educationalists, as was mentioned by the director, we also would like to show how we're teaching um, panel discussion as a method in our classroom as well, which is an example of our today's meeting. But uh, before we begin the panel discussion, I would like, I'm very happy and honored to introduce our distinguished panel of experts in the field of language education. And definitely each of them brings a wealth of experience and knowledge to our discussion. I would like to start with senior researcher, Dr. Ina Somoyukevich from Ukraine, who has published numerous articles on the English language teaching methodology, comparative studies and pre-service for language teacher education, and foreign language teachers' professional development. A warm welcome. Thank you for being here with us. Um, our next panelist today is Dr. Vidya Vingu from Romania. Our video teaches Romanian language and culture, as well as English for academic purposes and research at Vilnius University in Lithuania. Our video has published numerous articles on Romanian imaginary and collective mentality. His research interests encompass imagology, the theory of mentalities, literary theory, literary criticism, and the history of literature. A warm welcoming note. Thank you for being here. And uh, our next panelist today, and I'm honored to introduce you to our lecturer, Gitana Rimenina from Lithuania. Gitana teaches Spanish at the Faculty of Philology of Vilnius University. Gitana is a graduate of Vilnius University who successfully continued her studies in Spain. And I'm sure she'll go, she's going to share that experience with us. A warm welcome. Thank you, Gitana, for joining us. 
Our next panelist today, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Loretta Plotskina from Lithuania. Loretta teaches a course on intercultural communication at the Institute of Foreign Languages of Faculty of Philology. Uh, Loretta's work involves investigating the factors that contribute to the development of an individual's intercultural communicative competence. Loretta also analyzes international incoming students' perspectives on Lithuanian sociocultural realities and coordinates telecollaboration projects with universities in Chile and Spain. Research findings, a lot of these research findings have been shared at numerous international conferences and published in scientific journals. We are honored to have you with us today, Loretta. Thank you, a warm welcome. <laughs> the last but not least, as we say, is Dr. Adam Estradrev from the United States of America. Adam is currently a faculty member at the Institute of Foreign Languages, Faculty of Philology of Vilnius University. Adam previously served as a U.S. State Department English Language Fellow in Lithuania and is recognized as an expert in international language education. Adam holds degrees in philosophy, applied linguistics, educational psychology, and he has taught in various locations, including Japan, Lithuania, Poland, Hawaii, and his home state of Montana. A warm welcoming note. Thank you for uh, now, let's get started. And I would like briefly to overview the rules of our debate panel. Our panelists each, uh, will each have three minutes to respond to three thought-provoking questions. After each panelist's response, we'll have a two-minute panel discussion with all the panelists to delve deeper into the topic. And I have to <laughs> make a note about that. I will be strictly adhering to the time limit so that we have sufficient time for audience questions to ensure a smooth and engaging conversation. And when the three minutes for response are over, I will send some signals or raise my hand and let you know. After the panelists' responses, we'll open the floor to your questions. We encourage our listeners to participate actively and engage with our experts. We'll have 15 minutes for audience questions. Those who cannot join us in person, and we're thankful for those, to those who joined us, thank you very much. I'd like to mention we're live streaming this event on Facebook. So uh, we definitely welcome online audience as well. Thank you for joining us, those who are online. And please feel free to address uh, your question to a specific panelist if you have a preference and indicate the panelist's name when you pose your question. This will help us direct your inquiry to the most appropriate expert. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, dear panelists, I think it's time to start. And I'm ready to ask our dear panelists the first question. And as we are celebrating today, uh, European, uh, European uh, Day of Languages, so this is a very important day, and you're teaching a foreign language or another language. And so my first question is, what inspired your passion for teaching foreign languages? And I would like to start with Ovidiu, and would like him to share his insights about that. Yes, Ovidiu, please. Thank you for the question, and thank you for, for inviting me. Uh, first of all, uh, just a brief disclaimer, I'm coming from the field of literary studies. So, um, when I changed the field, I discovered how many things I overlooked when I, uh, I, I thought that literature might give an answer to some uh, questions that I might, I might uh, have. What inspired me is the relation, the connection between language and power. What do I mean by that? Um, I, I realize that words are not just words, and especially in the 21st century, when we don't have time or enough time to listen to others, it is important, extremely important, to be persuasive and to be able to choose your words and to be able to understand the words and to be able to speak different languages so you can access different cultural uh, uh, patterns. So that when you speak, you are able to express your thoughts in a very persuasive manner. These were the thoughts that inspired me uh, firstly. And after, year by year, I realized that speaking a foreign language or trying to teach a foreign language means not only to get accustomed with rules, and to discipline your mind, that is also very important, but it means to gain access to a cultural heritage. A cultural heritage that would remain unknown if it is known to you only by translations. So this 
immense possibility of accessing a culture in its original native language is something that personally interest me, uh, interested me uh, very, very much. I think this, uh, this is my answer to your first questions and I uh, will be more than interested to, to find out uh, the answers of, uh, of my, my colleagues. Okay, but before we proceed and hear other other panelists' views, so let's let's discuss what Ovidi, uh, some issues that he has raised and his response to my question. So any 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 feedback? I was I was a little bit concerned. I mean, that's a great point about language and power. However, I do believe that it can it's it's a very intricate relationship. It can only can not only have positive but also negative effects. Any ideas on that or? Should we be concerned about, I mean, learning more about power relations through language can make you more powerful, but at the same time, it can disempower you with an idea that you understand how sometimes manipulative or can be, oh yes, there are ways. So the way I translate what the message said by mm -hmm. Ovidius is that, well, it's not only, uh, it's, not, it's necessary to know not only the language, but also and to know what to say, but also how to say and when to say. And when I say how to say, I bear in mind our communication styles. For example, we are talking in a pretty direct way and you are expecting for well, us want to answer uh, just at the moment, but we have uh, some people representing other cultures and they need some time to think, to reconsider. And in this way, it is appropriate. So that's why language gives you power but also you, you have to bear some means in order to make use of the language. Yeah, just a few seconds. So language is a tool. No yeah. tool is dangerous. The person who uses the tool becomes dangerous. Oh, so no. that's, that's, or not, or yeah. not, but not the tool itself. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's my, my, my perspective. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, please. Uh, since please initially teach. the question was about uh, what inspired us to teach, right? Uh, okay, can I ask a, a kind of sub-question? So where does the teacher come in in this dichotomy of language and uh, power? I think the role of a teacher is to promote critical thinking. So to make students aware of the power of the language. Not to guide them to use the language in a certain way or another, but to make them aware. So this is a path that the teacher should open and then the student uh, takes from there and then moves on. And th this is this is my belief that we are guiding and we are making students aware of the very complex cognitive process involved in speaking a language, teaching a language, and trying to understand the language. That's a great point. Thank you very much, Vita. Thank you. Now, so I think you know we can continue then, and would like to hear your response then to the question: What inspired your passion? Mm -hmm for teaching foreign languages. Uh, when I was thinking about this question, I, uh, I understood um, that to me, uh, it, uh, it must be extended uh, to, uh, no, it must include not only what inspired, but also who inspired. Uh, in my uh, experience, uh, um, it is the people I communicated with that played a great uh, role in uh, me taking it up, uh, taking this, uh, taking up this profession. Um, to, uh, to put it chronologically, it all started with my parents who were both teachers and uh, uh, I could see the backstage of teaching and uh, uh, somehow I took it f for granted that it is a dedicated and 24-7, uh, nearly 24-7 job. Uh, besides, they spoke uh, several languages and uh, I remember listening to their stories uh, about other countries and uh, other cultures and uh, um, somehow the, the interest in uh, looking uh, out rather than looking in started uh, taking shape in me. Uh, another inspiration uh, came to me from uh, the people in modern music, in British music in particular. As I was a teenager in 1970s, uh, I grew up listening to a lot of Beatles, uh, Rolling Stones, um, Black Sabbath, uh, Queen, you name it. And uh, little by little, English became a real music to my ears. 
Uh, one more source of inspiration came from my university teachers and from my colleagues who helped me understand the difference between just knowing the situation of knowing uh, a language and uh, the skills and art on, and the, uh, probably the art of teaching it. And um, one more source that I daily use for inspiration is my students. I appreciate their questions, their aspirations, their ideas, and they uh, empower me with challenges and um, with um, extra energy. Uh, and I uh, now uh, now I'd like to use an opportunity this uh, this opportunity for expressing my appreciation of the students I uh, worked with in uh, Vilnius at Vilnius University last year. Uh, it uh, they were the students from the Faculty of Mathematics and Informatics and uh, the Faculty of Philosophy. And uh, I'm thankful to them for their contributions uh, of culture, cross-cultural experiences, of uh, uh, specialism-related knowledge, of uh, new fresh ideas into our collaborative practices. And this year I started teaching the students of management and business information management, and I hope for more inspiration. Oh, thank you so very much. That an inspiring, that an inspiring response. We appreciate that a lot. And I was wondering, uh, on the point of what we can be inspired by, and you mentioned uh, uh, in the deep references to music, and I was wondering, what is the role of Netflix today? How it is affecting, or maybe YouTube or social media? Do we have kind of a different trend? What is affecting as inspire? What can inspire young people today to get more passionate about languages? I mean, would you think, as all panelists are addressing to all of you who would like to respond? Do we have different sources of information today as compared to the past, or it's more about it's the dynamics and we should not set the limits to inspiration? What do you think? Oh, oh, yes, sure, sure. So I think it's not a matter of uh, ch changing uh, the source of inspiration, but a matter of uh, uh, expanding uh, inspirations. Those, uh, uh, even these days, they uh, still come, they can still come from music, from literature, mm -hmm. from uh, films, from movies from travel, um, so many opportunities to, uh, to actually get in, uh, to catch the want of learning a language. Thank you, thank you, all very good points. Uh, okay, I think, uh, thank you so very much for the response and uh, we touched a little bit upon some of the uh, aspects raised by Nina. I think we can continue and delve deeper into that topic and uh, Vitana, what inspired your passion? I think the thing is in us uh, people, my teachers, my university professors, because what we, I will continue with your question as well, because uh, no, there is a difference in learning languages, because I started learning Spanish in early 90s. By that time, our language studies were quite theoretical, we, we couldn't use them in life. And then I came to, to, to the university. And my first professor was Mafalda Tupi, who was from Brazil. So that was an experience. Okay, something different. The next professor was Eduardo Gonzalez from Madrid. The third one, Strimaiti um, Medici, who studied somewhere, uh, maybe in St. Petersburg, but I don't know where she was from. Then uh, Alfonso Roscon, our, our teacher. So uh, he was from Spain. So. Those people inspired me a lot because if they taught it differently, they showed me that uh, language is not for, you know, doing exercises and uh, memorizing the world. It's, it's a friendship, it's communication, it's different worlds, and we, we learn them, you know, with, with passion. So we, we, we just uh, wanted to know everything about the country, about the countries, about the other worlds, and it was totally new for us and we also were surprised at that starting at 18, 19, uh, the language from the beginning, you can learn, you can, you can learn it well, so because you just want to know everything about it. And, uh, and the next thing probably what inspired me, I tried teaching Lithuanian as foreign language, being a student at later. In, in various occasions, I taught in a Russian school, so children um, 
do my studies later even in Spain. I had a group of students who went to Ukrainian, some private students. And the process itself, uh, it's really stimulating. It's nice because you just, you know, we already mentioned it, that not with language is not enough. Well, uh, one anecdote probably was in, uh, in Madrid when we just um, went to live in Madrid because I lived for three years in Madrid and four years in, in Williams. The first experience, one of the first experience with Spanish was when we just went to hire an, an apartment and talking, we just said our names, we presented ourselves with, with the tenants and uh, then we looked at each, uh, each other with my husband because we understood. We, uh, we were, know the, the most complicated constructions in Spanish both. But we didn't know how to say nice to meet you. <laughs> I mean, those several situations, we hear that the first time, so understood. Okay, so culture is also important. Okay, all well, very good point. Thank you so much, Kiperna. I was wondering, uh, I wanted to maybe raise this aspect of this metaphor to ask us about befriending a language. So we had this metaphor with a video language as a tool language and power element and now we have this befriending language as a friend kind of personifying it as a faculty so it's i was wondering it's a dialogue well it's i love i love the extension of this metaphor that's a great point so I, I wonder whether other panelists would like to share their insight about this metaphor friendship metaphor or or uh having a dialogue with the language you're learning or teaching so i wonder how it makes sense to you anyone um, i would because I think that was a very interesting idea that, that my colleague expressed. I had the opportunity of teaching my language to native speakers in Romania and teaching Romanian abroad. So this is a very, very uh, uh, different experience. So it gives you a new perspective on your own language. So what I'm trying to say here is that language is not just a box and everything is there forever. It's a never-ending process. When, when, when it seems that you understood the nature of a language or the structure or the grammar, you suddenly realize that the language evolves. And this evolution is not random. It reflects the mindset of the people who speak the language. So having this perspective of, of seeing your own language from afar is quite a, quite a, quite a revelation in, in, in many ways. At least this is excellent, this was excellent my, my, my points, excellent points. I was also wondering, uh, it kind of trying to build this connection with the language. And I was wondering when I was just listening to a video about this fact. Now, people these days are trying to stay young and energetic. What we need for that is language. We don't need any plastic surgeries or anything like that. Let's just immerse ourselves into language learning and teaching. Um, right, it's kind of like another metaphor. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. sure. I may yes. add one moment. Absolutely, we have to. I think that uh, language is uh, a key. Well, everybody knows about this metaphor a key to the class of the people whose language we are learning. So, uh, the topic of our conversation today is well, how to build bridges. So, a language definitely is well the tool, as you said, or is a key. Uh, that well strengthens well the connection between the people we would like to communicate with. That's that's very that's another interesting metaphor. Language is a key to the path to the yeah. people. Amazing, I love it. So many metaphors today we are unraveling. And I think at that point we can proceed with Loretta. If Loretta, you would share with us uh, what would be your response to the question, what inspired your passion for teaching foreign languages? Okay. Um, well I would like to point out three factors and well, uh, the first one is the uh, human factor, teachers, definitely teachers. Well, there, were, there have been many teachers in my life and I wouldn't distinguish well any of them, but well, I'm really very grateful to them because they built me uh, in the shape as a, I, I am as a teacher. And uh, then the second factor would be uh, the age of history. We had the privilege to be born to live in. I'm really grateful to, 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 to the time I was born, me and my generation, uh, because uh, when we gained independence, we were very young and very enthusiastic, and we were 
exposed to a number of needs, needs to be a translator, needs to be a, an interpreter, well, to help, well, to network. And we became, well, some kind of ambassadors of our country uh, to the other countries. And when we felt that demand of all the languages, definitely, well, it inspired, this demand inspired us. And, well, I remember, well, those sleepless nights when I kept cramming the words <coughs> in biology, in chemistry, or in, in pharmaceuticals or whatever, just to be helpful to society and well, to represent uh, the company I work or the, the country I live in, in the best way. And the third factor, yeah, definitely students. So I would like well, to look at students as well the shapers of, of the methods I, I choose because when you enter the book, when you see the students sitting, well, you can decide whether this or that framework is suitable or unsuitable. And well, yeah, definitely there are different uh, learners, uh, the different type of learners, uh, different demands, different uh, needs. And uh, well, what is next for me? Just to adapt well uh, to them and be suitable. Thank you very much, Loretta. Uh, I really like this idea. I would like to initiate uh, our panel discussion on that, on the idea of whether language learning or teaching can be context-driven or context-bound. How much were context-dependent when young people, for example, would be, would be interested or passionate about choosing learning a language and when not? Or is it, should we discuss that or not? Is it an issue for discussion? I think we are completely dependent on context, mm -hmm. at least from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Language itself is context. When you try to teach it, in in my case, in a foreign context, so I try to I, I, I teach in Lithuania, or even if you teach it in your own context, flexibility and understanding the general context is really important because you cannot teach in a foreign language is not reciting poems on a stage. You interact, you adapt. You change your discourse in such a way that everyone is able to understand. You acknowledge there that there might be some ideological issues, because we should also discuss that. Um, we live in a time where we discuss about uh, political correctness. We live in a time when we discuss about many, many changes that have an impact on the way we teach the language and on the way we interact with students. So I think the context is pretty much everything. You can, in my experience, you can be the best teacher if you don't read, read the context, probably. This might dream everything. So I think the context is really important, at least from my perspective. Right. Anyone else would like to add? Have any further on some of the comments related to this context dependency? I was also wondering, I remember when I myself was at school uh, and uh, I was telling my parents that my future profession is going to be a language teacher and I was telling that to my student, uh, to my to my classmates, I wasn't very much respected for the choice. There was some sort of stigmatization about being just a language teacher, but then with the time I understood how actually, how enriching this experience is for me as a human being, as an individual, there's some sort of like social stigmatization of just a language teacher, I think definitely undermines the real potential of being a language teacher. What about you? Anyone experience this kind of like uh, attitude, like stigmatized attitudes, maybe not necessarily directed towards you, but you um, saw that happening when professional language teacher was not very much appreciated or valued for many reasons, social context reasons. No? And what you are saying is this true and for our uh, society's response uh, uh, towards well, the, the stereotype of a teacher is not really very positive. But as for me, I really do not mind because I know that there are many other activities behind well, my, my teaching, and uh, when I'm, I feel useful for, for the students, when I have what to share with them, I'm taking from other spheres, from other fields, why not be a teacher? I think there is also a general struggle in humanities. So everywhere in Europe, I don't know about the United States, but humanities are under siege. 
Latin, Greek, classical languages disappear from curricula. So there is a general struggle, there is a general attempt of redefining the, the paradigm. And it will be very interesting how we, the teachers, those involved in humanities, will defend our cause. Because uh, it seems to me that now we are kind of losing ground. So we have to find a way to re-legitimize humanities, because this is really important. I, I, I don't want to expand too much on that, but this is a, a thought that, that I'm having right now. I don't know about that. And you provide reference to the United States. Let's meet at the jump to that issue. So, Adam, you are from the United States. You, uh, yeah, I'm not the United States expert on the issue, <laughs> yeah, but sure. I'm not sure I'll, I'll stand with that. Um, well, there's the saying that, you know, those who can't do teach, which is kind of, you know, um, applies in some cases, but I think in the case of language teaching, it, it doesn't really apply. Um, but in general, um, yeah, I would say the profession of teaching is. Um, I would say respected, but not, you know, in practice isn't really respected. And, you know, we're not making you know, hundreds of thousands of euros for this panel, for example. So, um, I mean, you do it, I don't do it for the money, I do it more for the, for the love. But, um, yeah, in general, I would say, I don't know if language teachers are, are less respected than, than other teachers. It seems like teachers are generally disrespected you know, across the board. So what about what inspired you then in your passion? If we cannot quantify language, meaning, and uh, meaning towards principles of the human teacher, what inspired your passion? Well, I think my passion came maybe opposite um, of everybody else on the panel. Um, and speaking of like language and power and language and, and privilege, I mean, I have to, uh, to say that as a native speaker of English, and um, I didn't really have to, to struggle in the beginning to sort of legitimize my use of English um, as a teacher. Um, I pretty much just showed up before I even had a bachelor's degree. I, I taught in Poland and I taught in Japan. Um, and pretty much all I had to do was show up, be a native speaker of English, be you know, um, kind of in the, the age range where they would see me as a teacher and not too, not too young. And, and I, I got jobs teaching English, and I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, I was good at it, I thought. I was mostly entertaining people, but that was, you know, that was, um, it was easy money. Um, it wasn't until I went and got my master's degree in applied linguistics and started, you know, actually studying um, the structure and function, um, the sociology of language and, and use and, and language and power. Um, and you know, sort of critical approaches to, to pedagogy and you know, approaches to teaching and learning and trying to improve my teaching practice and actually seeing myself as a teacher and as a language teacher that, that I became serious and actually was like reflecting on what I was, um, what I was doing in the classroom. So that's um, in the US, it was more of like an English as a second language context, but now back in Lithuania, where English as a foreign language, again, it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting switch between those two teaching English in the United States and, or, um, and then teaching English again as a foreign language here in, um, in Lithuania. Um, and again, I have a little bit of privilege because I, you know, if people are saying negative things about um, English teachers, I'm probably not going to understand what you know, they're talking about anyway, unless they come up to me and say it specifically to me in English, but if they're just, you know, murmuring it by, <laughs> excuse me, behind my back, then it's, it's not going to affect me. Um, so I can kind of operate in a bubble. I have that. I have that privilege. Um, so mostly, I just have to deal with the feedback of my students, and that's. You know, uh, I think that's actually a good place to be, not to listen to um, what people who aren't experts in language and language teaching are saying, and, and focus on the actual, the classrooms and the context, and, and, and that's I think the best way to to be a better teacher and to stay um, fresh, keep your passion for for language teaching. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I was wondering, while listening to you, there were three concepts that were uh, prevalent in your response. Money. I don't know whether it's an American cultural heritage mm -hmm. <laughs> to refer to that to tell us more about this. This quantification of profession, but also reference to entertaining factor of language teaching. I was wondering, but it's also culture defining pattern that you have to entertain your students, you have to be some sort of like this. Uh, is it also a specific feature of American culture when you're teaching? It's kind of culture bound, or you think it's when you, if you teach a language, you have to entertain your 
So, I mean, if you think about like what we were talking about earlier about how students are um, watching YouTube and Netflix and entertainment and English and you know, listening to, to podcasts and, and most of their entertainment and intellectual input and you know, uh, all, all sorts of other things are coming in songs, um, are coming to them in English. Um, probably, I mean, they, I would say that they, you know, they they have access to, to so much. So if, if you're boring, if you're not, you know, kind of living up to, to their idea of, you know, giving them something quickly in a short amount of time, yeah, you're probably going to, you know, you're going to lose the, the connection with them. I'm not saying you shouldn't be, you know, giving them difficult content and difficult concepts and, and uh, things that they have to really work on to digest, but the way you deliver it, I think is, you know. I was also wondering, would like to raise this point for our panel discussion and uh, this entertainment factor. I mean, we can never, as individuals, compete with Netflix and YouTube. We're just an incapable of doing so. The entertainment industry is too much, very much developed. So then I was, I would tend maybe even to point out that maybe our function is to focus on more complex and complicated issues that are not provided by in, in, in the entertainment industry. And that is interaction. So there is a difference. When I try to entertain, okay, we can discuss about the concept because it sounds a little bit weird to introduce this concept in, in, in Egypt, but we have to, fortunately or unfortunately, there is a difference. They cannot interact with Netflix. So the form of entertainment is completely, completely different. When I try to play a role or to act in the class in a certain way, I get the feedback and they get the feedback so we can move on from there. And this is the alternative to Netflix and YouTube. They feel that they are part of the process. It's not a one-way street. I would be having doubts about that because there is a comment section on YouTube and everywhere else you can comment and uh, get engaged. But yes, I think uh, this still makes a lot of sense to me now. But, uh, anyone else would like to add to this idea of entertainment and language teaching? Um, yes, it's you know, the, it's uh, more and more used in, uh, internationally. The, I mean, the term edutainment, a combination of education and entertainment, right. which uh, probably meets the, the realities and the needs uh, of the times we live in. And I think that it is, uh, uh, partly it has uh, something to do with the general trend on, of gamification, but on the other hand, I think that uh, learning and learning a language can and should be fun. Uh, it's not, it shouldn't be like uh, clowning in front of the audience, but uh, uh, but uh, planning and organizing the activities in such a way that, it, they, uh, that they would involve uh, uh, students emotionally and cognitively uh, and into doing new things, into doing things in different ways, uh, into uh, bringing that uh, aha moment into the classroom uh, could be very... Um, I think that Adam wanted to add something. I just wanted to ask Adam, but well, then today to the concept of, of, of our, our teacher, uh, well, you mentioned that while being uh, uh, a teacher of, of English in Japan, mm -hmm. you were a teacher of Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, uh, were you more respected? Did you feel more respected being as a teacher in Japan than uh, as a teacher in Lithuania? Uh, it was different because there I worked at like a private school teaching business English. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if I've ever really felt respected as, as a teacher anywhere, um, but, uh, or not respected, because it's the only job I've really ever done, so I don't know the, the well, respect Well, today I ask you such a question, because yeah. textbooks tell us that, well, uh, in Japan, the, the profession of a teacher is the most respected one, yeah. and uh, I do not know whether we have a right or not, but, well, here, you know, there is a student from Japan, so probably let's pass her, yeah, to her yeah, to Lulu, well, she comes from uh, a Japanese university. Uh, could we ask her about, well, uh, these students, absolutely. well, pointing you towards the teacher. So who is the teacher in your life? Teacher. 
So respect that. It's, it's very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Would you like to say something? Okay, we have we have we have question. We have time for questions a bit later. Now, I think we're ready to move to question number two. And the audience on uh, online and here, uh, I think, ready for question number two that I prepared for my panelists. And this is the practical benefits of multilingualism for students in various career fields. I mean, it's somehow related to some of the aspects we touched upon in the first uh, when we discussed the first question. And I would like to start with Ovidia in the same sequence. So, Ovidio, what would be your response to the question about the practical benefits of multilingualism, knowing a few languages or more, more than a few actually, and what would be the benefits? In oh my God, there are so many. I will, I will just <clears throat> briefly name some of them, <clears throat> and I will, I will start. I want to start with the less obvious ones, and the first one that comes to my mind is the discipline of mind. Knowing many languages, being exposed to how a system functions and works in terms of grammar, structures, disciplines your mind. So this is helpful for any kind of cognitive, cognitive process that you want to engage in, whether it is related to speaking a language or not. So it is not only, as I mentioned, an accumulation of words, but it disciplines your mind. And the second benefit that, that, that comes to my mind is that you gain access. So if we use this metaphor with a key, it's one thing to have one key to one door and another thing to have multiple keys that might open multiple doors. So all of a sudden you gain access to cultures, people, and the way you understand the world changes because a language reflects, once again, the way a certain community understands and perceives the world. If I access many ways and perspectives on how the world is perceived and understood, then obviously this is, this is, this is beneficial. Then, in terms of um, critical thinking, we all have our core beliefs and values, and these are not changing very, very often. But knowing many languages gives you a certain flexibility, intellectual flexibility, that is, once again, essential in the world we live in. So you understand better, you understand more, you have a different perspective, plus your cognitive process improves simply because your mind is, is disciplined enough to understand patterns, structures, and different how, how different languages languages work. All very strong points. Anyone would like to add anything there to the statement? I was only wondering, uh, with reference to Adam's ideas about this quantification of uh, you, you, all the properties or 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 all the practical benefits you mentioned, that more conceptually defined, more abstract. So they cannot be defined in any objectifying manner and living in our consumer society. So, and what we can offer to young people by saying that your cognitive skills will improve, but we don't know how this can be exactly expressed. You are becoming a more flexible human being, individual, but in terms of any quantifying measures, you haven't mentioned anything. And Adam mentioned this lack of money or probably yeah. not very much pay professionally <laughs> or something like as I understood, so so the main practical benefits are this kind of abstract, conceptual. Well, all the points that I mentioned can be quantified. Can be? Yes, and I will give you an example. So flexibility, let's say flexibility. The ability of having a better understanding of the person in front of you means that whenever you engage in a conversation with someone you have an advantage. And this, and this is a concrete thing. Whenever I engage in a certain debate or whenever I have to uh, sustain a certain argument, the fact that my mind is used to work like this, okay, knowing many languages, gives me more power. The fact that I am persuasive when I speak <coughs> is, is quantifiable. You can see the effects of this every day of your life every second of your life, because everything is about communication. Whether you have a boyfriend or a great girlfriend, I'm trying to quantify now the, the, the result. 
whether you have friends, where, whether you have neighbors, in any kind, where, whether you talk to the police, it happened to me. I was involved in a minor car accident and I had to describe to the police how it happened. So I think I was a little bit more coherent than the other guy and I think that mattered. So this is quantifiable. This is not theory, this is not abstract. So this is something that you can, you can see and all the students can see immediately when they walk outside outside the door. So it's there are moments when quantity is quality, by the way. But this so is another idea. Agree. Thank you. I was wondering what Gitana would say, uh, what her response would be to those practical benefits of multilingualism as a teacher of Spanish. Well, I think not only as a teacher of Spanish, but I mean, almost every, every language you learn that you speak, you just, in a very practical way, you can translate, <laughs> you can interpret, uh, you can maintain a dialogue. And I keep thinking about this powerful position because I'm. Well, I, I don't know if this is about the power, but I, I probably I am result oriented. So, so for me, the most important thing is to to you know to receive some result of of the action. So probably uh, language gives you possibility to you know to express yourself, to to be creative because in that interpreting you just use uh, you know all your brain, all all your knowledge. Well, and that's it. Okay, so we see now a bit of a more practical side of that perspective, especially in the, regarding communicates and various communicates. You mentioned being an interpreter, so it's kind of very much language oriented. But I was wondering, and I would like to ask uh, all the panel, what do you think? Can we, when we are discussing with the students the uh, practical benefits of multilingualism, do we necessarily have to give reference to professions directly related to language use? Or there are some other professions mm -hmm. where we can also uh, Any prof uh, profession speak about needs, mm -hmm. but in order not to be so local, you, you just have to learn more. To, to, you can find many information you need or two of you in the other country. In other research, you, you just have to, to go to a conference and, and understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. You can learn. So it's kind of like it's language studies kind of make like you you can access any career in other words, mm -hmm. and it's kind of more like you uh, are you kind of pass this threshold of just a language oriented career. It can can be any other field you would say. Mm, I think, for example, very practical example. For example, yes, there are very good nephrologists uh, in in Spain. So the nephrologist from Lithuania uh, can be interested in those researches. Mm -hmm. So what I mean is it is. So, so in, any, in every country, there can be strong specialists here. So, so you just can have an access to, to those knowledge. Okay, that's a very good point. Especially considering the fact when we are always raising an issue, especially in Lithuania, this communication between doctors and patients and language is emphasized a lot. Yeah. How doctors so, speak to their patients. And probably those doc if, if the doctor learned a few more languages, communication is much better. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Vitana. And I would like to pass over to Ina now on, on the, uh, the practical benefits she would like to mention, mm -hmm. share with us on multilingualism. Okay, thank you. Um, probably approaching the answer to this question, I would like for first to draw your attention to some difference between two terms, multilingualism and plurilingualism. Um, according to the Council of Europe uh, documents on uh, language policy, we, uh, we refer to multilingualism uh, if, uh, to mean uh, the presence of different languages, uh, say, in a certain geographical area. In higher education, we can talk about multilingualism um, in relation to the international community of students and teachers. Uh, with, uh, which, um, uh, with multiple uh, opportunities for cross-cultural uh, communication uh, in different contexts, uh, social, uh, academic, uh, pers personal, and that, uh, and here I would, uh, with my observations of the situation in Vilnius, uh, at Vilnius University, I would say that uh, uh, I'm really amazed at the uh, to, uh, 
the tradition of internationalization of education here. Uh, here, I can see that uh, at any faculty we can meet um, an international community of students, and that uh, changes. Uh, at least my uh, my uh, it has changed my views on different cultures on different uh, and uh, uh, added uh, uh, more and more perspectives to uh, looking at the same things. Um, with uh, as a teacher, I know uh, uh, due to my students that there are many right ways, not only to pronounce a word, to name an, an object, but also to express uh, express uh, oneself, and that enriches. Uh, um, all of us as personalities. By the way, there's a point that I would, uh, was going to make um, about um, L1 personality, like language 1 personality and language 2 personal uh, personality. In, um, uh, in an intercultural setting, uh, I find it uh, much easier and much more interesting to um, uh, give my students a chance to uh, to make their L2 personality as big and as versatile, as developed as their L1 personality. Uh, because uh, I don't know if, you, um, uh, if you're aware of that about, uh, about uh, yourselves, but we are uh, slightly different personalities when we use uh, different languages. So the, the, most, the biggest uh, um, type of personality type is the one when we use our native language. And if we, as teachers, do not take care of uh, giving our learners a chance to, uh, uh, to create emotions, to create new experiences in the, say, second or third, or third language, um, our students may not uh, feel as confident as, uh, uh, as they do uh, when speaking their native language. Uh, Speaking of multilingualism, multi uh, we definitely uh, should use it as a chance to get rid of stereotypes and prejudices that we might, that some of us may have uh, about uh, people from other cultures. And uh, thus our um, uh, cultural sensitivity would, um, would, be, um, would be developed and make us uh, people of more subtle nature, I would say. And speaking of the other term, plurilingualism, it's about uh, the competencies a person uh, who speaks more, more than one language has and uses um, in different situations. And uh, no doubt, a um, plurilingual person uh, has um, lots of advantages, both uh, at the job market and uh, on a personal level. At the job market, we can talk about uh, um, more opportunities for, for international businesses, um, better communication skills, uh, stronger relationships with uh, um, international colleagues. Because if we want to be understood, we can use uh, English as an international language. But if we want to understand others, so it, it makes all the difference if we um, if we can uh, communicate with that person in his or her native language. Uh, on a personal level, uh, I would say that uh, um, being plurilingual means very often better decision-making skills, better uh, problem-solving skills, uh, uh, thinking outside the box, um, flex um, linguistic and cultural flex and intellectual flexibility that you mentioned. So um, lo lots of benefit, benefits, though they sound, maybe they sound a little bit general, uh, but they are definitely of uh, the quality type. No? So and quality, I know quality is sometimes, uh, or rather quantity is sometimes quality, but the quality in language learning and in a cross-cultural setting is very important. Okay. Thank you very much. That was a very extensive response. We appreciate that a lot. Sorry. No, 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 that's okay. We will love it. And, I was just wondering about this personality development future that we've all been focusing on. Can we then just say, use another metaphor that language learning and teaching can be effective, practically effective in the sense that you can say, why not to go into a psychologist and they need some psychological help because if learning and teaching languages can help us to deal with a lot of personal issues that we just read about from our speakers. What do you think? 
they need help because actually going to a psychologist these days is an expensive matter. It's, an, it's, it's not that cheap and knowing, so we can save money on that, to say okay. the least. But, okay, uh, so the, the point is whether we become all uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde for a while teaching languages, we develop skill personalities. Jekyll and all trades, yes. yes. So, um, <laughs> <the> first, <laughs> sorry, sorry, it was just, it was just yeah. entertainment, so this entertainment. is the title of entertainment. That's right. Right. Okay. Um, I, I don't think there is a risk there, and even if it is, going to a psychologist might be an indication that your brain works. Because if it doesn't, you don't need a psychologist. <laughs> so, okay. so uh, sorry, am I too blunt? No, no, it's good. We, so, uh, we shouldn't be afraid of all the... Showing our weaknesses? Maybe the language opens opportunities for that as well? Uh, no, we shouldn't be afraid of challenges. We shouldn't be afraid of difficult things. We shouldn't be afraid of exploring. This comes with risks, obviously. One of the risks might be that you cannot juggle with these two personalities that you mentioned. And but you feel... Yes, yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was just, it was just my poor way of understanding it. Really so, no, 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 I, I'm not. I understood. So it might be that it, it can pose a, 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 not a threat, but a challenge. But since when are we supposed to be afraid of challenges? That's what keeps our, us uh, going, and that's that, that's what keeps our mind going. It's not an easy process. Oh, it's a great metaphor now. Language is a challenging journey, dynamic challenging. I think it is in many ways. Okay, let's hear one now from Rebecca on what she has in mind. What would be her response to about practical benefits of multilingualism? I'm sure, I do agree with my colleagues and many of the ideas that Martin got probably will say, say as well. And uh, then, well, I would like to, to focus on the metaphor as language uh, provides you some power. And well, being equipped with the, um, the person's linguistic repertoire, uh, you are given you know, many powers. Uh, well, first of all, I become braver. And uh, since, well, I come from the Kingdom of box country, or whatever we call it, but well, what I saw, what I uh, was exposed to, so well, uh, the, proud, uh, the pride of being uh, of a member of the nationality, so I, I, I can just sit in here and listening, probably the languages I know equip me to speak the others, to tell the others about my country, about my culture, rather than learning the language, I'm the producer, I'm the performer uh, of the benefits and the achievements of my country. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was wondering uh, what Anna's response to the question, uh, what is it going to be like? Because you mentioned as a native speaker you're more privileged, and how do you have, do you, what about uh, what do you think of this? Well, I have a preface for, yeah, benefits. going back to what Ovidio said about the quantification of like the more languages you speak, the more intelligent you are. Um, so I was thinking about like musical intelligence, like learning a musical instrument also is very important, like, you know, can create all these you know, neural pathways in your brain. But does playing more musical instruments make you more intelligent? So I don't know. So that's the preface for me being from the United States and only speaking English. So I'm trying to argue for monolingualism here. Um, it's probably not going to work out very well. But uh, I think it's important, again, in the United States, um, most people are not um, bilingual, multilingual. Um, they pretty much just speak English. And some of the problems with that um, are cultural. I mean, you also have limited knowledge of geography and um, you know, of world events, things like that, that um, um, when you learn uh, a foreign language or when you learn a second language, you get that sort of cultural piece together, which you know, contributes to, um, to peace and to understanding and to willingness to communicate with other people and to understand um, ideas from from different perspectives and not only think that um, that your culture, your way of doing things, or that your language is is the best. Um, so Lithuania is, I think, is a great example of uh, 
of a society where well, young people especially speak multiple different languages um, fluently and they're able to communicate with people um, you know, at the drop of a hat in, in pretty much in, well lots of different languages which is great um, and I think that that's you know that contributes to the culture in, in a way that you know and, and it prevents kind of isolation and um, kind of you know the, the bad form of, of nationalism where you're isolated and think that um, that nobody is you know understanding you and you, you can't communicate with people. So. Um, thank you, thank you, Adam. Regarding uh, oh, what I wanted to add, yes, please. We just want to add Absolutely. well to the uh, to, to to Adam's idea that well, I mean, the way how Lithuanians will find the, 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 and have their relationship with the languages. We come from a very small country. Well, geographical position is favorable, but well, we need to build the networks with the rest of the world. And yesterday, well, while searching for some information on the uh, numbers, how many people know how many languages and so on, I came up well, to a very uh, interesting data by Statista, which tells that Lithuanian working people speak more than two languages and they make up 97%. So Luxembourg comes the first one and Lithuania is the second in the European in the, well, the countries of the European Union. So 97% of our speak well, at least uh, nine or two, uh, sorry, for one or two of our languages. Amazing, amazing. Thanks, thank you very much. Just going back to Adam, and just, uh, I, I was wondering, Adam mentioned his experience of teaching here in Lithuania, and you uh, are exposed to multilinguals right now because you have to teach English, but at the same time you're exposed to Lithuanian and other languages in Lithuania. Has it how has it somehow benefited your career, your own career as a teacher, this uh, being exposed to this kind of multilingualism in everyday life and in everyday basis? Is this for me? Yeah, um, this is I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Practical any practical benefits? Um, I don't know if there's any practical benefits, but I mean, sometimes it feels difficult. So um, I guess that's a sign that I am learning and growing. If it's and sometimes challenge. it's challenged, it's if it's uncomfortable, right, right. sometimes so. Um, yeah, I hope so. That's one of the reasons why I decided to come here. So, um, to be challenged and to to be a better teacher, to be a better learner. So. Okay, and uh, so we heard about a lot of practical benefits. So, and practical benefit for your career now when you're exposed to multilingualism. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say if I was um, to apply for a job back in the United States, um, it would definitely be a bonus that I lived um, and taught. Abroad, that's a great point. Um, because yeah, I will bring that unique kind of you know, cultural perspective. That's I would say that is unique in the United States. I think we can end at this point and move on to the last question for our today's panel discussion, uh, dear panelists, audience. So we are ready for the last question, uh, and this is about educators and teachers, and what and the question is as follows: What strategies can educators use to encourage creativity in language learning? We we'll touch upon. Entertainment. I don't know whether they are related. You will tell me more about that. Let's start with the video. Creativity in language learning. What would be your response to that? That's a challenge. Um, so, I think, um, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, at least this is what I, what I try to do. Um, I try to uh, play different roles and to play the devil's advocate time to time. Simply because I want the students to be exposed to the other side. So one of the strategies that I use is that I tell my students whenever there is unanimity about something, I tell them, it seems to me that this is not clear. So I have to play the devil's advocate. It's it's the strategy that, that I'm using uh, very, very often, just to create antagonism. Antagonisms might be conflictual in real life when we talk about people of relations, but when we talk about intellectual and cognitive pro process, antagonism is, uh, is, is, is fuel. So without antagonisms, your mind cannot perceive different perspectives. So what I try to do uh, in class is to create intellectual antagonisms. So I'm not encouraging uh, uh, conflicts or aggression. I, I just 
and just try to create an environment where students are exposed to different points of view in a very non-aggressive manner. Could you give us an example? Uh, uh, because this antagonism as a concept has gotten very negative because you were trying to explain that this is not about aggression. So would you give us an example of how is it due to you encourage creativity by antagonizing a discussion or, or counterfeiting statements? What exactly is happening in the classroom? Okay. So I can, I can give you uh, one very brief example. I just bought my tickets uh, for Jordan, Peter, Jordan Peterson's talk in Vilnius uh, nowadays. So how does that relate with what you what you were asking? So when I see that uh, there is in, in, in my class, I have one group where um, all of them uh, all of them are pro Slavoj Žižek and you know, Yuval Noah Harari, so leftist in a way or another. And um, when I see this unanimity in, in thinking and in ideologies. I simply just position myself on the other side. Not because I like Jordan Pearson, because I don't, honestly speaking. But I mean, some of the ideas can be contradictory okay. or uh, okay. very... But, but the point is that, and this is the example, the point is that the intellectual antagonism, I don't think the intellectual antagonism harms people. It helps us to be exposed to different ideas and different different ways ways of thinking, so that is what I mean by antagonism. I'm not promoting uh, aggression. I'm not promoting uh, any kind of conflictual uh, situations. But I think, in terms of the intellectual process, if you don't have this antagonism, your mind just is in a lazy state of. Uh, reusing the same beliefs and ideas and you need the challenge time to time. So this is what I understand by antagonism. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, and, uh, I think I would like to point out this maybe as I understood and uh, let's see what, how other panelists would respond to my understanding. So you're discussing antagonism. It seems to be like some sort of a debate methodology to opposite views on the same topic. You try to encourage that to different, even opposite perspectives sometimes. You encourage that, you encourage a discussion on that, not just not to be contained in one mode, in one pattern. Is this what you have in mind? Okay, so if if we prefer the term debate, then okay. I was just wondering think, as a practical application of antagonism. Okay, okay, so okay. that okay. is the case. But I still prefer the notion of antagonism, but the, the, that's not, this absolutely, is not a place for so. conceptual debates, but yes, this is the meaning of, uh, of what, I, what I said. So I was wondering what about the rest of the panelists? Mm -hmm. How are you practically, are you trying, are you trying to evoke creativity by exposing students to opposite views at the same time, simultaneously, or what's your attitude to that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I would uh, absolutely agree with you now, now that you mentioned the debate practice that we do in the course mm -hmm. of English as a uh, well for academic purposes and mm -hmm. research uh, with um, uh, with all the motions the students have an opportunity either uh, to uh, be on the opposition side or on the proposition uh, proposition side irrespective of the fact whether they personally support uh, this motion in the way it is form formulated. And uh, 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 with um, my experience of, uh, of uh, uh, it happening in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the classrooms at different faculties, I can see that the, uh, those students who have a chance to, uh, um, to contradict themselves they, uh, they kind of have enjoy it even more because uh, they feel happy and confident if they find the right arguments and counter arguments that uh, uh, otherwise they might never have thought about. And that is both challenging and, uh, and creative for the students themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let's move on. And I would like now to... Uh, Address uh, Gibana, and what about your strategies to encourage creativity in language so learning? I think I, I have to provide with needs to, to, to be active in classroom. So, so 
my first uh, you know, concern is to, to establish certain routines that um, students would feel confident in a classroom. Uh, that they would know what's expected of them and what to expect from me. And uh, you know, while I do this, I just observe them and uh, look what things are they interested in and what are their practical response or with audio material, well, with things, with materials I work with. And then I offer discussion according to their you know, interests because the people would talk and will be creative when they, when they will have something to say for that team. And uh, you know, we all know that the best ideas come when you close the doors of the auditorium. So, so sometimes I give them a second chance to, to discuss the same themes because they, they are prepared mentally. So it's one of my strategies. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I was wondering about this idea that you raised that what we discussed that language learning is kind of always dynamic always evolving as a personality but this is the same for the teacher you want to encourage creativity you never know where you can go what methods you can choose it depends on the students you're working with it can change you have to be during the class during the semester so it's like you have to be very flexible as a teacher as well yeah. to be creative yes, definitely. Okay. okay thank you anyone would like to add anything to this point about this kind of like ongoing change in your learning in your teaching strategy how you about to sum up? Well, I have yes, challenges yes. personally, so I, I hope that my students will like them too. So therefore, like, I get some kind of inspiration for us as well. Uh, while talking about uh, uh, the 21st uh, illiterate person, it is the issue. The person is described not as the one who doesn't know how to read or to write, but the one who is not able to listen, to learn, to unlearn, to relearn. And uh, uh, what I'm getting at is, uh, well, to say that both we, the teachers, uh, have been exposed to a number of models, to a number of strategies, how to teach languages. The same our students. They come from schools or primaries, basic, secondary school, gymnasium, and they also we're exposed to, well, to a number of strategies. What is left for us? Well, just well, to focus on the target person and to find the, the most interesting and suitable for them. Uh, what else I would like to stress is IT and uh, uh, the, the, well, the, the, the things they offer, the opportunities they offer, or the tools, and one of them well, could be uh, for the collaboration project as, as we've been doing. I'm not promoting it, but well, I'm just well telling that well, uh, probably virtual exchange and exposure uh, to something, not antagonistic, but well, uh, something new, something fresh could be a challenge uh, for, for, for the student. And the, the way we uh, learn is that something new and unusual is not necessarily good or bad. It's just different, and we have to accept the differences. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, my dear panelists, we have two minutes left until we uh, move on to questions and answer session from the audience. So, uh, still two minutes. Adam, Anna, uh, who would like to add? Would you like to add anything? Adam? I agree with what everybody has, has said so far. I think that creativity is a delicate balance between like control and, and freedom in the classroom. If there's too much control by the teacher, then creativity suffers, obviously, and the freedom to flexible to be flexible also kind of disappears. But if it's too much freedom, then it's also not creative because then the students are you know, doing whatever they want and it's not really directed. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think all good, good insights and finding that sort of careful mix, that careful recipe that you need in order to be successful. It kind of depends on the people that you're working with and the student group and you have to know what they're thinking. So you have to you know, have them uh, communicate with you and feel comfortable communicating with you and being you know, free to, to introduce some challenging ideas and, and stuff like that. Thank you. Ella, there was one more minute left. Anything to add? 
Okay. <laughs> uh, with um, uh, teaching ELT methodology in the, in the background, uh, uh, I'll try to be, uh, to, uh, try to discipline my mind and just give three ideas as briefly as I can in relation to uh, boosting creativity in the language classroom. One idea is that um, we shouldn't underestimate the value of uh, Bloom's taxonomy uh, with uh, those six levels, uh, cognitive levels, uh, the highest being creation, um, uh, and uh, the fact that it is based on uh, the previous five, five levels from knowing to evaluating gives us a chance to, uh, to or gives our students a chance to, to be successful in um, designing, uh, building, uh, uh, elaborating, suggesting uh, new uh, new ways and new uh, uh, new ways of doing things. Uh, my second suggestion was very practical. It's about the use of uh, imagery and visualization in the classroom. Uh, by involving our five senses, we can help our learners to become better writers, better listeners, better uh, better readers, and better speakers. And uh, the third idea with me was um, that of uh, drama pedagogy, uh, involving um, Lots of things from role play to uh, improvisations in the classroom. They create, uh, um, they help to create emotional, uh, or rather, they help to develop uh, emotional creativity in the uh, with uh, language learners, and uh, um, yeah, and gives them a chance to become really confident uh, uh, users of the language. Okay, thank you, our esteemed panelists, for sharing your valuable insights today, individual, and during our panel discussion. So, I, I'm sure we gained a better understanding of the passion that drives language educators, practical benefits of multilingualism, strategies to encourage creativity and language learning. And now it's time to turn the spotlight on our audience. So, next 15, actually, we're having less, less than 14 minutes to your questions and discussions with our panelists. If you have uh, if, uh, so we see we have only at least now we have one question before we read it online. So let's address our guests uh, uh, in, uh, who are present with us today in this panel discussion. Does anyone have a question? If you have an individual question, just let the panelists. Most of yes, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for your uh, inspiring and thought-provoking answers. And my question for you is about creativity. Um, would you agree that artificial intelligence has killed creativity? If yes, how? And how do we fight it? If you know, I think both of the answers. If you want. That's a great point. We haven't touched upon that, chat GPT and artificial intelligence in general. So, so does it help us to become more or less creative? Does it undermine or does it increase creativity? Yeah, yes, so really wants to start. Yes, First of all, I, I just um, have to uh, to remind myself that this uh, issue of creativity is not a new issue. It didn't appear with ChatGPT. We already have literary texts written by machines. So in terms, and this is not nothing is new here. But the question for me at least is why do we need to see it in terms of we fight it. So it seems to me that we have to find a way to coexist. Because if we fight ChatGPT, I think we all know the result of the battle. So we have to be smarter. What does it mean to be smarter? We learn how to coexist. This is not a new thing. We did that when electricity was invented, we did that when internet was invented, we did that when coronavirus appeared. So if we humans have something that enables us to, uh, to, to keep our, our role in the world, is this amazing ability of being flexible and coexisting and adapting. So I think in terms of creativity, there is a lot of space for everyone. ChatGPT has its own creativity. I personally cannot fight that. I don't wish to do that. But I don't know how it affects my own creativity or the fact that I want my students to be creative. So I think there is a there is a place in the world for everyone, including ChatGPT. Thanks, 
Okay, other panelists, do we have other responses? I think that no? it's just some kind of chicken box, which we just in the best way. So everyone will be sick with it and then forget it. Okay, yes. Uh, what else? I teach writing about forgetting people's true communication, so it's really a challenge for me. And while I share Vivi's opinion about to start coexisting with it, uh, well, personally, I really do not see much of creativity to be, to be developed by AI, but while I see it as a tool for developing students' critical thinking, and when you see you identify, you spot out, well, the differences between you and your creative world text and well, the ones created by AI, so while well, this is, well, just the benefit of the way you answer. Thank you. Uh, right, thank you. Uh, right, do we have any more questions uh, from the audience sitting here? Okay, let's. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yes, I'm speaking from the forefront of Tag Speak Hour. Um, how do you think everything that you talk about translates to schools? Because I feel like there is a huge disconnect right now between what's happening in the university and you know, higher education, language learning, and language teaching. And with what is happening at you know, actual middle schools, you know, how do we approach that? How do we, I don't know, transfer the knowledge and the methods and everything to, you know, students, which are school kids and teachers that teach there? Okay, do you, uh, right. So you kind of see that there, there is kind of a gap, and gap is widening. What about our panelists? Do you see it also as a kind of widening gap between schools and universities? Should, should be somehow bridged, or we? What's your response to that? I do agree that the gap, uh, we should merge that gap, the gap well, with some, some cooperation times or whatever, because we do need well, to know about the context of schools. And uh, well, as for me, well, I feel somehow isolated well, in the area, in the context of the university. But probably this is well, my just way of thinking. Any other responses? Well, having worked with um, K-12 teachers in, in the U.S., anyway, there is, I mean, it's, it's always a gap because higher ed develops the, the methods and, you know, we try them out and then we try to, you know, to get everybody to, um, to adopt them. But there's always some sort of a disconnect and usually it's because teachers are kind of unwilling to change their practice and you know sort of the government bodies that oversee education who you know are accountable to parents it's, it's just a complex system that unfortunately just kind of is dysfunctional when it comes to like innovations and in, um, in pedagogy and there's no um, even like professional development workshops for teachers I mean it's a, very, it's a great way to kind of symbolic you know a gesture towards improving um, teaching practices in schools, but again, it's, you know, it's kind of, you can't force teachers to participate in professional development and to change what they're doing in the classroom. So it really is kind of a slow process. It's much faster in higher education where, you know, it's a smaller group of people. We get together, we say, hey, we're going to, you know, we're going to revamp everything, but doing it on a national level for um, 12 different grades is just logistically, it, it's, it's difficult to do to get everybody on board and you always have teachers who are who are resistant and who are kind of sticks in the mud and say, you know, the, the old fashioned way is is the best way to do it. So it's it's kind of an unfortunate situation, but it's I would say it's a universal situation. I mean I haven't been to everywhere in the world, but it's the same in the USA. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we answered the question. Uh, okay, any more questions? But maybe while we're thinking about other questions, we have a question online, and this is from Luna Chaita Lohitian, actually our colleague from the Institute of Foreign Languages. And this is the question that she is asking for our dear panelists. Do you have some pieces of advice on how to foster motivation and passion in language learning? We discussed this entertainment factor. Motivation, passion, how to make our students more motivated and passionate about the language and learning the language? I think motivation and passion could be contagious. Right. So if you have it, it might spread. It's a two and one. And that's a good news. So um, that's good news. It's not that common. I like to say, you have to start with yourself as a teacher, right? Yes, in a way, because you cannot. Uh, you, uh, as a teacher, you cannot. You cannot fake this. You cannot fake passion. There are techniques of 
appearing more passionate than you are, but they work up to a certain point. You cannot fake. You are there in front of the students for one semester, two semesters. It's, it's a lot. You cannot fake. It. So if you have it, I think you can at one point become a model. They, they, they might start thinking that the passion that drives you and the, the, the motivation that drives you is really something that they should pay attention to. That's that's what I that's what I personally think. Okay, what about other panelists? Do we have any advice from Lena regarding motivation and passion? I believe not the advice, but the case described. Okay. okay. Um, well, several years ago, there was an Erasmus student, oh, well, a student from well, Anatolia Institute for Public Languages, who wanted to study at Dresden University for cultural studies. And one of the requirements of, uh, of the hosting university was to, to know German at level B1, B2. And well, the students didn't know German at all. And believe me or not, well, she was a, she covered uh, the all the levels. I mean, A1, A2, and B1 within half of the year. Within half of the year, she started from scratch. Well, it, and well, still, she's she's an example uh, of motivation and as an, as an example for the other students. If, you, if they really need the work, you can cover the mountain already. Okay, both external and internal motivation factors. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we're almost coming to an end. Uh, any more questions from the audience here? Oh, the very short sure. Yes, please. Yes, yes. yes. Um, I think first of all, thank you all the participants for a very, very interesting discussion, very many interesting points. And I especially like the idea that we need this sometimes have to defend ourselves to prove that we are important, we are less than anybody nowadays when women go to global science. And uh, here I'd like to share the idea by uh, an Israeli historian, Harari, who wrote a famous essay entitled 21 Lessons of the 21st Century. And he raises a brilliant idea that we, Homo sapiens, became so, so powerful because we learned to reason collectively. And I would like to continue the this idea with the question, what, uh, what lay the, the foundations for this collective brain, collective mind to be shaped, to be built? Uh, we can ask these obvious linguists, philologists, language teachers, and oh, also translators, intercultural communication specialists. Wow. I'm yes. a mathematician, and uh, sometimes we have some heated debates with her. She is a real fan of her job, and she says mathematics is the foundation of the world. I have a real theorem, this is the foundation. And I say, yes, mom, I agree with you, but uh, Pythagoras wrote his theorem in Greek, and somebody must have translated it into your language to understand it and to teach your students. Yeah, so uh, if we continue talking uh, metaphorically, uh, so mathematics, science, uh, to a super powerful computer that uh, keeps uh, the world developing. But we linguists without the electricity, without which the computer is out of power. Thank you. This is an amazing ending note for our panel discussion. And now I want to thank our esteemed panelists for sharing their valuable insights today, individually and during panel discussion. And contributions, your contributions have been invaluable. I hope we touch the hearts and minds of our listeners online and here. So we bring this discussion to a close and I'd like to invite our panelists and all our wonderful guests to come together for a group photo. I hope you won't mind this. I mean, those who want to participate in a group photo. So we'll capture this moment and then uh, this insightful conversation and going to share it on our Institute Facebook page. Those who are ready for the uh, group photo, please join us. Thank you all once again. Everyone have a wonderful day and we thank all our online listeners who are here with us and um, joined us for this discussion and right, um, we see how many listeners are here, everything is seen, thank you very much. And now uh, we are ready to, for the group photo, we send off our thanks to the listeners and everyone who was with us and listeners here, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> We celebrated, the, uh, we celebrated European dual languages in a very good way, commemorated the importance of language in our life, language learning and teaching. 
And I end my video so that we can proceed with a good photo and with saying goodbye to all our listeners. Goodbye.